And um, uh, with us today, we have uh, Keith Larson, producer of, uh, of the film. <laughs> and we have uh, Mr. Joe Staten, Charlton Comics artist alum. Hello, hello. Uh, we have Jackie Zabruska, the other producer of the film. <laughs> And we have Carl Wildman, the, the son of George Wildman, uh, legendary editor and artist and writer at uh, Charlton Comics. And I, of course, am, I, and I, of course, am, uh, am, am, am uh, Jerry Mathers as the beaver. <laughs> I am Paul Kupperberg. Uh, I, uh, I started my career writing for Charlton Comic Books, and, um, and I've, I've managed to somehow squeak by for the last 41 years on that. So, hey. Um, and uh, we are here, of course to uh, see some, some new clips, clips old and new, which are we leading off with that? Uh, well, we have the trailer prepared. How many people have seen the trailer? Well, that then, many. Perfect. <laughs> All right. It's, it's terrific. And it's accompanied by a pan flute soundtrack. That's right. Yeah. So uh, this is the trailer we launched here a year ago. Zanfir, the master of the pan flute. Charlton was absolutely essential. If I hadn't gone up to see Charlton, then none of the rest would have happened the way it did. They gave me work when I didn't have it. That's where it all began in Charlton. The beauty of Charlton is everything was done under the same roof. Management there was questionable at times at best. And I think this is a matter of right hand not talking to the left hand. These two gentlemen met in jail. They put together this company called Charlton because both of them had a son named Charles. And then when they got out, they started publishing. At one point, they actually did have to move the comics operation into a bowling alley. Suddenly you hear a strike and somebody going, yeah! <laughs> you know? Trump was a sidewater of a sidewater. They were out there doing their thing and nobody was paying any attention. And then there was Charlton that was producing what seemed to be kind of off-brand. I couldn't quite tell what they were doing. Charlton was just a hodgepodge of weird titles. It was the three-legged dog of comics. Guys were, were free to do really whatever they wanted within the boundaries of good taste in the comics code. C-A-T-A-P, yes, cheap. They were cheap. Hell yes, they're cheap. John threw uh, nickels around like they were manhole covers. He was the cheapest guy you ever met. What they needed was carbon-based life forms who knew how to type. I don't know how much I should be saying about this. Charlton was selling some of their characters to multiple people. Yeah. That's kind of funny. Well, I'd be willing to confess to a felony on camera. Sure. The printing press that they had was used to print cereal boxes, which is a whole different process altogether. The printing was horrible. Paper was much lower quality than anybody else was using. You could smell them beginning to decay even as they were rolling off the presses. Or you'd pick up a comic book and the wrong insides would be in the cover. They decided to shred tons of archival comic book pages. Somebody just throwing out these original pages because they couldn't possibly conceive of them being valuable. Beautiful artwork. They laid on the floor so the guy painting the seal didn't drip paint on the floor. And if it was a bad snowy day, they would throw them down on the floor so it would absorb all the slush. It's something out of a sitcom, which I suppose is why you're making this documentary. Charlton has its place and, and deserves to be remembered. The Charlton guys were the new guys on the block, trying really hard. I just happened to be there at the right place at the right time. There was a creative, powerful force that lived at Charlton Comics, and it was producing top quality work. I loved working for Charlton. I could have used more money. It was the people from Charlton that added juice to DC Comics. They gave it to the comic book industry a lot of good characters. There wouldn't be a Watchman if it wasn't for the Charlton characters. I think Charlton should be uh, proud of the stuff they put out. It showed in the work. I mean, some people were busting their butts, and that was amazing, amazing stuff. I am perfectly willing to say, sometimes you really do win the lottery, and I did. Sorry for the audio. We'll, uh, we'll limp our way through. So why, why don't you guys uh, talk a little bit about uh, you know how, how you got the idea and how it got started? Okay. We were actually at this convention. It was in Bridgeport two years ago. Anybody go to that one down at the Bridgeport Arena? And it, if anybody remembers, it was the expo part was on the hockey floor and it was really packed in tight. So if you got stuck in one of these long aisles, you weren't going anywhere for you know 20 minutes. 
And that's what happened. And we were stuck, and I looked up, and I saw on the scoreboard Bob Layton, Paul Coverberg, uh, Denny O'Neill, all these names. And I said, oh, let's go to that. We'll go sit down for a while. My feet are killing me. And we walked in expecting to hear about Iron Man, Batman, and all this stuff. And, and, and instead, they talked about Charlton Comics. And I was like, what? What's that? So I opened the show guide and saw the Bullseye logo and remembered, oh, those. OK. Uh, Jackie was like, uh, what do we do now? I'm like, let's just rest and then slither out and be <laughs> polite. And they started talking. And it was so captivating. It was all the stories you just saw. We ran up to the front, and we were in the front row for the rest of the panel. And it took me till the next day to realize, oh, that's a movie. So I called her back up, and I said, what do you think of this idea? She liked it so much, she said, let's go back. We got in the car, drove back, paid to get in, and cold pitched. Uh, started with Denny, went to Bob, and they both said, if Paul, does, if Paul wants to do it, we'll do it. So we went to Paul, and he expected to never hear from us again. Oh, yeah. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. <laughs> no, listen, you know, I, I, people come up to me all the time and say, I got a great idea for a movie, for a book, for a comic book, for, uh, you know, a new Kanish place, whatever. <laughs> and it's like, okay, very nice. Let me know when, when you know. And you never hear from them. And happily, you know, Keith and Jackie were back in touch uh, within a relatively short time and, uh, and offered to buy me pizza to pick my brain. And it's like, geez, you know, buy me pizza and, yeah. Well, it's like me nose. Good. Like yeah. me and the Pope. <laughs> and, um, and, yeah, from there we've been, you know, yeah, they've been, been doing most of the work, but. Um, That's good. We still meet up for pizza every once in a while yeah. and occasionally pancakes. Yes. <laughs> chips. We'll go to chips. chips. We'll get pancakes. That's so yeah. good. <laughs> Um, so uh, you want to add to that, Jackie? Yeah. I, I, th I think you covered it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's basically the lore. And it's on our website, the About page. You can read the uh, fantastic tale of tired feet. The exciting feet. tale of tired feet and not being rude. <laughs> 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 so uh, with that, uh, we struck out and wanted to put together that trailer with some of the faces that are very recognizable for a fundraising campaign. So we struck out on our own out-of-pocket expense and ran around with Jude over here and started interviewing all those faces and jamming them into the trailer that we launched here last year. Since then, we've been going on and uh, interviewing other people who've had experiences at Charlton. We're going to need more volume, Paul, right now. Oh, yeah, so anybody watching online, um, you are not going to see the exclusive content because you didn't come to the show. That's right. Um, it's not that we don't want to share it with you. It's that we need to keep things private. We want to save stuff for the movie, but people who show up and get to see the exclusive content, they're, they're a little bit luckier than you, but we will send you some exclusive content, including a blooper reel from Terrificon's own Mitch Hollick. So stay tuned for that at the end of the panel. Next one is uh, T.C. Ford, and T.C. kind of talks about, he was there at the end, and he talked about that what was unique about Charlton, and Paul can, and Joe can, Joe especially, the, uh, the whole thing was soup to nuts, all inclusive, from concept on a napkin to shipping in trucks, so very rare situation. Um, you want to say anything about that? Um, yeah, it was like, like one huge flat building that kind of went on for a long way and, and um, there was uh, Sal and, and, and George and they were, and then Nick showed up and they were editors at one end and then Joe Gill was sitting there typing all the time and you know would write like you know 20 stories a day and, and behind him there were uh, you, know, you know it's a lost art hand separating um, uh, the, ar the, uh, the, co the art, the uh, art, the 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 color, uh, and little ladies from the neighborhood were were hired to do that and um, had their own way of doing it. And then the presses were out there, and it was you know you you came in the front door and comic books went out the back door, and the presses were always always moving. So it was uh, very homegrown. <laughs> well, that I could add to that too that once they moved the comic division over to where the bowling alley was, it was actually a far enough walk they had to get a three wheel bicycle to carry the artwork and whatnot. And to, because they thought that you know, there was so much time wasted walking back and forth right. and whatnot, that mm -hmm. it would actually uh, improve production in some way, shape, or form. But that's my two cents. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right, yeah, so we'll talk about um, who worked at Charlton. Everyone. At, yeah. Literally.
literally almost if if they're famous for comic books, they probably did a stint there, and that I mean that includes and me. And, and this guy, you did a lot too. When we interviewed Paul, like I brought up some stuff that he had forgotten that he had done for Charlton, Ooh. like when you wrote for E Man. And well, that was uh, first comics uh, when, when they brought back. Yeah, first comics brought back E Man um, uh, when Marty mm -hmm. was writing it, and I uh, filled in um, uh, on on I think three issues. Yep. And um, yeah, I had forgotten I had done that. I I just found another thing the other day. I was like. I was going through a box of stuff to, you know, see what I was going to bring here. I was like, Atari Force? What the hell did I write? And I opened it, and there's this story about something called Chuka, which I guess was a character in Atari Force, and it's this thing I did with, with Dave Manick and Keith Giffen, and it's like, I, I, I have no memory of this. Oh. It is furry little creatures running around on, a, on an alien planet and just making sound effects, and it's like, <laughs> so it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I, I don't remember this. So. Yeah, that happens after about a thousand stories. Yeah. But the more research we do, the more we find out. Um, there we go. Was there who dust actually, on that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, who actually worked there? I mean, that includes Steve Ditko, Neil Adams, John Byrne, Paul Kupferberg, Joe Staten, Nick Cuddy, George Wildman. The list goes on. Jim uh, Jim Aparo. I mean, we. Don Newton. Don Newton. Um, Schuster was there for a little bit. I mean, Mike we. Yeah. Mike Newton. Zach. The. Essentially, if you look up anybody Jose. who's anybody, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. Yes. Yeah. They they probably well, took a turn there. Well, low team talent for a lot of guys that didn't have their start, and they could actually get work, even though they didn't pay really well. But then once they're published, then they can go off to a DC or a Marvel. Right. And then they got a book in hand and say, okay, here I am. Oh, well, you are capable. Where a lot of times it would be a one or two page story, and then Dad would turn around and say, like, who did this for you? Because yeah. this is evidently not your work from. From your portfolio that yeah. you showed me, I always, I always regret. Uh, I, I later came to regret. I always is a long time, and really, I haven't been around that long. Uh, but I, I, I came to regret that when I started writing for DC, I stopped writing for Charlton. Um, I mean, yes, DC was paying me three times as much for a script, but still, at Charlton, I could have written all this funky, fun stuff. And you know, even if DC rejected the. Uh, the, the script, I could have gone, well, I'll just sell it to Charlton, you know, because they'll buy anything. A um, little flexibility. <laughs> flexibility, I think, is a good word for it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, so I should have stuck with them. I, I probably, you know, I could have had a lot of fun, but, you know, I was... Uh, uh, well, depending on what you wanted to write also, I'd have to say that they had a wide variety of titles to... to absolutely. Because you want from romance to superhero yeah. to war... I, uh, Westerns. Yeah. I mean, back then, you know, I was I was 19 at the time I started writing for Charlton, and um, I wanted to write superheroes in the worst way, and I went I, I went on to do exactly that. So, um, but you know, uh, Charlton wasn't doing that in those days. So, and if I did have a mystery story, House of Mystery again, three times the salary, so you know, the page rate. So. So I think that segues into our next clip, which features Joe Sinnott. Um, Joe, uh, excuse me, the legendary the, Joe Yeah, Sinnott. excuse me, the legendary who welcomed us very warmly into his home. And, and Joe is, he's like the inker for Marvel. A lot of people wouldn't draw for Marvel unless they knew that Joe would be inking his work. And when uh, the Comics Code came into play and stole a lot of work away from the big two, Marvel and DC, Joe found work at Charlton. They were more than willing to, to help him out, and they gave him enough work to, to keep his family fed and housed. Yeah, and I think what's cool about this clip is um, when he was preparing for our arrival, his son Mark was pulling all the stuff he did, and he said, Dad, how many pages do you think you did? And wait till you hear this number. Wow, that's an... Uh, I, I don't know if you have a concept of how many, 2,700 pages, say a tw 20 pages in, a, in, a, in a, an average book. How many issues is that? I can't do math. Let's ask the penciler. Right. I Joe? Mean, yeah. Pencil, ink, and letter, yeah. three separate things, so yeah. if you that's, that's break it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a ma and in a five-year period, I mean, Jesus, you know. But even still, I mean, he was doing Marvel during the day or, or Dell yeah, or whatever sure. have you, and then and those then, at yeah. night. And, and these, were, these were all short stories, too. Yeah, he was doing like six like and eight pages. Six yeah. And yeah. Eight yeah. Pages. Yeah. 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 So. My dad was doing the same thing, because when he was doing freelance for Charlton back like 59, 60 or so, uh, a lot of times he was doing 
regular advertise, and then the Charlotte work would hit after supper, yeah. and then go downstairs and knock out. He'd, if he had a 30-page book, it was like three pages a day he'd weigh out, and then first half, go for approval out the code, and come back and get inked after he got approved. So, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so leading up into our next clip, uh, another famous comic book guy who worked at Charlton didn't actually use his real name because uh, back then it really wasn't cool to moonlight for other companies and you know your boss might get mad. Uh, so this guy went by the name of Sergius O'Shaughnessy, AKA Denny O'Neill, the guy who kind of saved Batman, made him dark and emo again, what everybody likes. Um, so it was a real treat to find out that Denny did a turn for, for Charlton, and he wrote some pretty great stuff. Um, yep. yeah. Children of Doom is probably the best known and most favorite mm -hmm. out of his. And The Wanderer. The Wanderer, yeah. Yeah, yeah Wanderer. So uh, this clip Welcome. is uh, Jackie asked him how he got his start at Charlton. So I, uh Yeah, it, it, you know, I, I cold mailed, uh, you know, a bunch of ideas to, to uh, Nick Cuddy uh, at Charlton. I, I did have a slight advantage. I, I was doing a fanzine called The Comic Reader with Paul Levitz at the time, and, uh, or had been doing it. And so we had gotten to know people up at the, at the companies, but still, you know, that just kind of got you read. It didn't, you know, it, it was no guarantee that you know, you were gonna get anywhere. But yeah, I sent him a bunch of stuff that had actually been rejected by Gold Key. Um, and um, you know, the next thing I know, I get a letter from, from Nick Cuddy going, yeah, we'll take this, we'll write that up as a script and uh, we'll probably do that one too. And you know, here's your, here, here's your, your payment voucher. <laughs> and it's like, you know, best 25 bucks I ever earned was that, that first story <laughs> for a five pager. Um, and um, yeah, so, it really was very democratic, and uh, you know they just uh, and we uh, we recently revived the Charlton Comics imprint. We call it Charlton Neo because nobody was used to using it for thirty years, so we thought you know we might as well. And um, uh, we're, we're the same way. We have an open submissions policy. You know anybody is free to send us uh, uh, you know samples of their work, and we will consider publishing because. It's in the grand tradition of Charlton Comics, along with, you know, the anthology format and the fact that we're doing all these different genres, you know, western superhero, uh, the romance, whatever anybody wants to do. Uh, I got a hot rod story. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm proof like hot rod definitely, story. definitely. I got a, I got, a, I got a hot rod story. Um, uh, you know, that oh. that I want. That that's yeah. I just got to get around to writing. So yeah, so yeah, all this stuff. A side um, note: Did you know Nick Cuddy is a heck of a magician? If you know it or not. Uh, is he anything like Magic Moments? Though? I don't know about that, but I'll tell you. Good as Magic Moments. When I was a teenager, he, he took us down to uh, New York. I didn't know that. And, no? uh, and taught me how to, he helped him build a table so I didn't have to do magic and so like kids' oh, birthday cool. parties and stuff. But he is a very talented person. I think that's where he got a lot of his inspiration for writing some of the, mm -hmm. the, the horror stories and stuff like that because of, and plus the mannerisms of like a cape and stuff like that. It was great. Right. He had a great style. It still does. Yeah. Yeah, Nick's a good guy. He's, uh, I, he, um, he went to work at DC Comics as an editor uh, for a while in the 80s and, uh, and I got to know him a little better while he was there and, and you know, and always thankful to him, you know, I, I, he started my career. So, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that uh, either he was, he saw something in me or that he was a big enough sucker to fall for it. So <laughs> either way, thank you, Nick. That we'll be uh, all of his hair also. Yeah. <laughs> that was some wrenches hair. The, the, the bushy, the bushy, yeah, that, that big, that, yeah. We're going to be visiting him soon, but this is a perfect segue to probably the best how did I get hired at Charlton story I've ever heard from our next clip. Uh, you want to tell the story quickly, Joe? Swing that mic over. <laughs> um, I, I, I may be the only one who was, um, like, hired on his honeymoon. Um, <laughs> I, I was, uh, I, and uh, George says I am probably the only one who came in with his new bride uh, looking for work. Um, and I, I had gotten married one day, and, and, and Hillary and I were headed from New York to Mystic um, for a very brief, very cheap uh, 
honeymoon. She had to get back to teaching like immediately. And I, I've been trying to get at work at Marvel and DC and like that and taking samples around and, and, and um, Charlton was on the way. So um, I had samples. We stopped. We went in. Uh, Sal was, Sal Gentile was still the editor, although uh, George was kind of the power behind the throne. And um, we, we took stuff in and, and they were very nice to us and as as, as I've heard later, uh, George leaned over to Sal and said, okay, let's keep this one. And um, that's, that's how I... about me, too. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when we got back, we were living in Brooklyn. When we got back, I had, I had a, uh, a script. Uh, I, I picked up a script and paper from, uh, from, from Charlton, and I had a deadline. And if I had hit the deadline and the art was okay, you know, it was okay. And um, that's, that's how I got work. It was called uh, The Curse of the Hanging Man. It was in uh, Ghost Manor. Uh, I've forgotten the number. But it, was, it was dated 72, but I actually did it in 71. And that was my first. It had a really nice Steve Ditko cover. Uh, that was one good thing about a lot of the Charlton horror books. They had really nice Steve Ditko covers. Yeah. Um, and um, I, di I, I did it, I turned it in, uh, I, I, uh, and, they, and they thought it was good enough to send me another one, and that was, uh, what, what month is this? This is, well that was in April of 71, and that was 45 years ago, and I've been doing it ever since. So that's, uh, that's, that's my story, and, and thank you, George Wildman. <laughs> He's sticking to that story. Mine too. was April 3rd, 1975. That was the date of the acceptance letter. It was uh, April wow. 3rd, so I remember that. So uh, Joe was actually the first formal interview we did for this movie, where we sat down and spent a, you know, an afternoon. Excuse me, an afternoon with uh, Joe and Hillary. It was fantastic. And if you get down to the booth, say hi to Hillary. She's great. And, uh, we got interrupted a few no, times. I, I still have the same, the same job and the same wife. <laughs> <laughs> They're adorable. Me, not so much. So uh, a lot of times we were talking before about not being able to get to the location or having control a lot over the location. We got interrupted a few times. We were out on Joe's porch here, and uh, the mailman interrupts us here, which causes Joe to come up with a really clever idea for this movie. So Charlton had some some really great guys working for the company that uh, even though the head honchos over at Charlton didn't care much, these these men really did, and they tried to make Charlton something yeah. better than what it was. And it, I don't know, maybe they wouldn't be as fondly remembered if it wasn't for these guys, who knows? Uh, but one of them was Dick Giordano. He's the guy who got the action hero line going up and running. He lit the fire under its ass, and later on DC bought these characters and made them into the Watchmen. Um, we also have George Wildman, another guy who pretty much started PR for Charlton. He took the show on the road. He would do morning TV shows in different towns. He got the cartoon characters up on their 18-wheeler distribution trucks. Children's so, hospitals. Yeah, yeah, he went to children's hospitals. He'd draw Popeye for them, so he got uh, the positive word out and spread the word across the country. And then you have Nick Cuddy, who brought in more of the entertainment value. Like, he went and saw Space 1999 and said, you know what, this would make a great comic. Let's get in on that. So emergency. you have emergency. Yeah, yeah. so the if it TV show turned into the comic, which is a whole other genre. You know, yeah, you know, completely. But if it weren't for these guys, maybe Charlton wouldn't have gone as far as it did, even if it didn't succeed. Um, I think that Dick probably has, Dick Giordano has the best reputation out of all three. He was the most well-known and uh, well-liked. Um. Dick, was, Dick was one of the truly nicest people uh, uh, in the business. It was, uh, it was a pleasure to work for him, and he was the type of, well, he was vice president at DC at the time I was an editor, and um, uh, he was a boss you could always go to and always get fair treatment from. Uh, and, uh, and you could always count on the fact that if he wasn't interested in what you were saying, uh, he would just turn off his, his hearing aids and pretend he was anyway. <laughs> <laughs> A little side note on Dick Giordano also. 
Uh, about a week ago, I was going through some old canceled checks. We were going through the studio and whatnot, trying to clear it out. And I have a check from 1957 that Dad wrote to Dick Giordano. So he wrote to him with Charlton Day, so it must have been for $8 or something like that, like Christmas time or something like that. But it's got both your names on it. So I'm saying, gee, you know, somewhere in history, in sure. Charlton lore, you know, a Dick Giordano and George Wildman signature on one check is kind of a yeah. little oh. bit of a rarity. You know? That's pretty yeah. cool. Wow. Yeah. Good segue, Carl. Um, we interviewed Carl's dad uh, earlier this year, uh, George, and he was amazing. And you guys um, came in with an amazing amount of equipment and did an amazing <laughs> job for him also, might I add. Thank you. And this was another difficult uh, environment to try to, we had to find a good location. Um, it was busy and noisy. Uh, well, so that was an assisted living at the time. And they, they had a small library area to set up, very narrow. Uh, but again, noise issues and whatnot. Everybody's very sensitive. So with that said, he did a great job. You know, and, and then you guys actually, you waited, you were patient, and, and things went swimmingly. So... You know, on that note, that's appreciate it. Um, we, we are down to the last couple of minutes uh, yeah. here, so I know there's a, a, a clip you want to run. Yeah, uh, we'll have to skip through. Sorry we couldn't get through all these. Uh, come to a future panel. We'll, we'll eventually get through all these. This seems to happen a lot because there's so many good stories to tell. But since we're at Terrificon and we're talking about some of the difficulties in making the film and the locations, Jude over here has just been phenomenal at thinking on his feet. We interviewed Willie Franz down in Brooklyn a couple of weeks, about a month ago, and it was not ideal, to put it mildly. And by the end, we, it looked like we were in like, a nice office space with you know, nice, all his books in, on display. And, and uh, the lighting was complicated. The sun kept coming in and out. It was raining sunny, raining sunny. It was just a nightmare. But um, we shot Mitch Halleck, the showrunner for this convention. Who knows Mitch? You'll see him. You'll see him wandering around. Mitch is in the film, and uh, we shot him at Cave Comics up in Newtown, which is about as big as the riser right there <laughs> that the table's on. It is a shoebox, and uh, it brought a whole bunch of logistic problems and interruptions. So I cut a little blooper reel. This is Mitch Halleck uh, of Big Fedora Marketing, producer of comic conventions in Connecticut. Do I get to keep my pants on? It's not one of those movies, is it? Oops, that was that, we swear to God. It's in the shot. I'll stay on my mark. I'm not! I swear to God. I'm right here. Am I in focus? Yes. Don't move. I'm not moving. Look at her. I'm not. Are we still going? Oh, all right. I was going to say, because I was like, whatever. They had a little part of themselves that had some artistic integrity. And you just picked that up on mic, so I don't know. Do you want me to get into the whole thing about how I heard Charles was in front for the month? Uh, so Charlton Comics, you got that? Yeah, I don't want to say it though, because I don't want to put like a black thing over my face. I heard they were involved with you know, they, they sold printing presses. Those guys were not only trying to make a living, but they were also, you want me to take it again? They sold printing presses to Mussolini, I heard. All right, just throw stuff, because I know it's, there's nothing worse than sitting in an editing deck for freaking 20 hours trying to find two seconds. So if you say you just want two seconds, I'll do two seconds and then we'll be done. Love and labor, they don't really go together. Yeah, unless you're making babies, and that's another story. Called somebody DC Comics. Can we do this All right, what do you want to do? Well, you got to tell me you want, you got to tell me what you want. Who's going to pay 40, how long has that been under the, I'm not buying this for 40 bucks. 40 dollars. No, they're going around this way. Okay. The Partridge Family was one of the books that Charlton Comics acquired the license to in the early 70s. It was popular with many young teenage fans that read Tiger, was it Tiger Beat? Tiger Beat and, yeah, my sister would read this. But hold on. That's all right. We'll do it again. That would have even been crazier. Well, I'm going to wait till this fellow walks by. He's doing this. You want the door slam? And that's that. We did? Forty dollars. <laughs> but we love Mitch. Mitch is the whole reason, uh, kind of why this this whole movement happened. I mean, if he hadn't put together the show that brought the Charlton guys down there, they had the panel, and then we got lazy, needed to sit down for five <laughs> minutes. I mean, that's why we're here now. So we owe we owe Mitch a lot. And, and you, it's been good had, to us. now we were friends with great people like Joe and Carl yeah. and even Paul. <laughs> I'm just in it for the free pizza and it's a lot of fun it's great so you so can follow us on uh, Twitter at Charlton Movie Facebook Charlton Movie and we have a website CharltonMovie.com we have a YouTube channel where this will be preserved again with the uh, 
please stand by where the clips are supposed to be. And uh, well, you'll know. You'll yeah, know. and we also have like Pinterest. And there's a whole bunch at the bottom of the page, but uh, those are the biggies. So. And on that note, we have to thank you all for being here Perfect. and for your interest in, in Charlton, the movie. And uh, we hope to see you next year Just at the premiere. Oh. And our special surprise, um, our, our poster artist, if you've seen our teaser poster, uh, Paul Harriet is here, and we will give everyone in the room <laughs> a free poster that he'll sign for you. I'd also uh, like to, uh, I just want to mention too, up here I've got uh, copies of Dad's bio, Di Donnie Pitchford put it together. That's right, of yes. Actor, and I've got copies, if anybody would like a copy of I don't know if we have enough, we've got a big crowd. So, uh, have we got enough? I think we do. If not, get in touch with me, you can log in our website. That's on the back of this too. Again, sorry for the audio problem, but... We it's got a total it, Charlton right? panel, so I mean, right. it's only <laughs> fitting that you get the full experience. <laughs> I don't know where we can hole up to sign these things, but uh, you'll have to Pied Piper or somewhere. Thanks, guys. Yeah, everyone.